Uh, we have a, a really great um, presentation on polyvagal theory and expressive arts therapy, essential tools for clinical practice. At this point, I want to go ahead and hand over today's presentation to Soraya Keating. Um, Soraya Keating is a registered expressive arts therapist, a registered drama therapist, and licensed clinical supervisor um, who's worked um, for 25 years in schools, prisons, hospitals, psychiatric units, and in private practice with children, teens, and adults. Um, so that's just my starting intro, but uh, Soraya, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And um, thank you everyone for being here, for taking the time to today to explore some tools from expressive arts therapy that are informed by polyvagal theory. So today, uh, my intention is to to look at the importance of both co-regulation and self-regulation as they apply to taking care of our nervous systems and also um, our clients' nervous systems. And um, we'll be doing a series of arts activities and somatic practices to look at what, what supports our nervous systems and, and specifically looking at interventions that can help someone or ourselves when we're experiencing more fight or flight kind of responses. So when we're anxious, when we're feeling angry, defensive, aggressive. Uh, and secondly, uh, what can we do to support our clients and ourselves when we're having more of a freeze response, a shutdown, when we're dissociating, feeling hopeless, helpless. Um, we'll also identify two important practices for strengthening what's called the social engagement system, aka the vagus nerve. And we'll talk a little bit about more about what this all means. Um, the language of polyvagal theory, perhaps you're already familiar with this and perhaps it's new. Uh, and another objective is for you to, at the end of this, this practice, be able to articulate three essential points of polyvagal theory. I love this quote, look to the nervous system as a key to maximum health. Just invite you to find a comfortable position. Could be sitting, lying down, and just notice how your body feels in this moment. And in particular, going right into the language of polyvagal, Notice where in your body you feel calm, where you feel energized. Also notice if there's any parts where you feel more frozen, shut down. And notice if there's any parts of your body where you sense more of a fight response or a flight response, either a uh, the fight being the, the kind of more aggressive, ready for defending oneself, or a flight, a kind of worry, anxiety, running away. Okay, so just noticing that, doing a, a body scan, but using that language. Like I noticed for me, my heart rate is like a little bit, it feels a little bit elevated than my normal heart rate because I'm a little bit nervous. So I have a, you know, what you would call a, uh, a fight flight, my sympathetic nervous system is, is turned on a little higher right now. Activity two, if you were to befriend your body right now, what would you do? Really simple. So if you were to really listen to your body, what would you do? I, uh, what position does your body want to be in? Right now I'm a little bit hunched over looking into the computer, I kind of feel like I want to stretch out my arms and lift my heart up. Yes, that feels good. So just if you were to right now, wherever you are, listen to your body, what does your body really want right now? Or maybe you're hungry or thirsty. So I encourage you to try right now to befriend, just be the best friend you can to your body as a, a core ongoing practice 
of getting to know your nervous system. And, and this is the essence of what we get to do with our clients as well, but we need to know our nervous systems to be able to center and be um, allies of co-regulation for our clients. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now that we've tuned in our into our body a bit, let's let's um take a moment to see the environment around us. And as you look at the environment, and by the way, I invite you to get out something to write with and a piece of paper. So in inviting in now something that's pleasant for you to see or pleasant that you are seeing and write down that one pleasant thing. Now write down a second pleasant thing. So for example, I see sunlight and trees looking out my window. What do you see that's pleasant? And write them down. What do you hear that are pleasing or is, excuse me, pleasing to you? I hear my son laughing in the next room, <laughs> sort of pleasing. Um, what do you hear or what do you imagine you hear? Right now I'm imagining I could hear the wind outside. Okay, and moving through all the senses here, we, we won't go through all of them today, but um, taking time to do this kind of orienting can be a grounding, calming, or sometimes an energizing practice for ourselves and for our clients. When we write down these words, we're also creating what's called a word garden of resourcing words that we can then pull from later to create all sorts of poetry, creative writing, polyvagal theory, a brief summary. If you're familiar with the work of Stephen Porges, he founded polyvagal theory in 1994. He wrote a, uh, a very dense book. Um, the title is here. But essentially, uh, Stephen Porges um, is a behavioral neuroscientist that was actually looking at how to support preemies, babies who are born prematurely in, in their nervous system. And I was really looking at that key element of co-regulation, you know, as we know in the healing profession, it's all about the relationship that counts. And, and Stephen Porges elaborated this in a really elegant way, the importance of connection and the relationship in, in our well-being and also in moving in a trauma-informed way to help to get to know and and be an ally, be a best friend to our nervous system. So there are two parts to our autom autonomic nervous system. And these are um, the autonomic nervous system kind of happening more under the radar of our consciousness, as opposed to the somatic nervous system where we run or pick up a fork and eat food. So a little more under the radar. So we have our sympathetic nervous system, which as you may know, is responsible for, well, number one, energizing us, but also for our fight flight responses. And then we have our parasympathetic nervous system that is our rest and digest nervous system in its most optimal mode, but also is responsible for the freeze response. We'll see a little more about the sympathetic nervous system here um, and how it either energizes the body or when someone is overwhelmed, they'll go into a fight or flight response. If they, if there's a perceived danger, even if there's no actual danger, In the next slide will show you the parasympathetic nervous system, which is again, the rest and digest response, but also it's the part that um, freezes or shuts us down, puts us into a place of depression, dissociation, hopelessness. Um, that's one part of the parasympathetic nervous system. The second part, which was the groundbreaking work of Stephen Porges, was the discovery of 
the vagus nerve and the, the two parts to the vagus nerve. One being the, the dorsal vagal, which is more of the rest and digest and the freeze response. And the second, the ventral vagal nerve, which actually is our, um, it's what creates the ability for us to connect to others um, and to ourselves and to the world at large. Um, and to a, you know, if you believe in a higher power to a higher power, it's our connection muscle. And Porges realized that it was that ventral vagus nerve that was key to um, helping people who were in a trauma response come back to uh, a more regulated place. The term polyvagal, as you see here, poly means many, vagal means wandering nerve. So the vagus nerve uh, starts uh, at the back of the neck and then uh, the ventral vagal comes down through our face and all the way into our heart. The dorsal vagal goes down the back and then wraps around and into our belly. Um, another term coined by Porges was the term uh, neuroception. Now it's not on this on this graphic right here, but this. Um, this graphic is demonstrating the concept of neuroception or this idea that we are always assessing if unconsciously for safety. Am I safe with this person? Am I safe in this place around me? Am I safe um, inside with me? So we're always assessing for safety. So our nervous system, depending on how safe or unsafe we feel, uh, will tend to be in three different states. And, and these are the states that we, we I was kind of um, alluding to on our body scan. But as you see here, we have um, our ventral vagal state. And I, I want to invite you to think about a symbol for the ventral vagal. I brought this little Buddha. The ventral vagal is that place of ease, connection, where we feel relaxed and curious, grounded, okay? So that, that place where we can connect to ourselves, to others. We know our needs, our boundaries. That's a ventral vagal. So if you have a, an object for ventral vagal, please do. It's also called our social engagement system. Now, if we get triggered, something comes, life comes poking at us, um, in a difficult way where we get overwhelmed, then we go into fight or flight. So here's here we are feeling all grounded, some trigger happens, and then the fight or flight takes over. And I invite you to find an object to make it concrete for that sympathetic nervous response of the fight or flight. Okay, so ventral vagal has disappeared. And then with some people, what happens again is they are in overwhelm and, and unable to cope with a, either a real threat or a, often a perceived threat, not a real threat when it's chronic, is they'll go into the dorsal vagal mode of shutdown. And I, I brought this little bear to represent that, that shutdown. All of us, according to Stephen Porges, go through all of these states, you know, even throughout our day, we cycle through them. So <clears throat> it's not um, it's not that moving to sympathetic or dorsal is is a bad thing. What what's hard is when we get stuck or our clients get stuck in a state of a dorsal shutdown or a sympathetic fight or flight. The challenge is and the invitation is to learn about our nervous system and help our clients learn about their nervous system so they know how to bring themselves back when they're in shutdown or they're in fight or flight to get back to that easeful, connected place. My little Buddha here, okay? So how does expressive arts support? Well, expressive arts supports us in co-regulation and self-regulation. One of my favorite quotes from great EMDR teacher, Curtis Rowanzoin, most trauma is trauma that cannot be put into words. 
And to me, that speaks to the, the power of um, bringing the arts and also bringing in somatic practices as helpful healing ways to bring us ourselves back to that ventral vagal state to help us express what's inside and also access resources. Co-regulation, key to our clients when we're working with clients. Well, first it's um, key to any relationship feeling safe, not just therapist, client, parent, yeah, child. Completely match. Um, I'm not sure if somebody was trying to come through with a question, but uh, so co-regulation is is key to any anyone feeling safe. Um, so if you think about, you know, when a child is having some symptomology, it's often because there's something in their system, whether it's parents or a school or oppressive social system that's that's not safe. So the the child shuts down because they're in a they're co-regulating. So what's holding them is not safe. So. Um, so really key is for us to know our own nervous systems and be able to bring ourselves back into that ventral vagal state so we can also be there for our clients. I invite you to create your own nervous system explorer journal and ask yourself, does this activity freeze me down? Does it shut me down? That would be dorsal vagal. Does it put me into fight or flight? Sorry that the words are reverse. Or does it make me feel more disconnected? So we're, we're, we're being scientists of our own nervous system and then helping our clients to be like scientists or observers of their own nervous system. If we go to the next slide. Uh, just a different way to do this is a little more simplified perhaps is is to come up with a list of, as you see on the left, nervous system nourishers, what nervous, what, sorry, what nourishes your nervous system, who being around, what people, what, what activities, what places, so who, what, where, when, and also what beliefs and inner qualities are nourishing to your nervous system and then those of your clients versus what are triggers what are, what are the opposite of nourishing, being nourishing to your nervous system? So when I'm around certain people, what activities, what places, um, what time of day or seasons, and also what beliefs and inner qualities really make me off, make, make, kind of put me in a, a sympathetic state, a fight or flight, or a dorsal shutdown. Okay, so want to invite in that as a practice and you can make your own little old-fashioned sheet <laughs> again with nervous system nourishers nervous system triggers and one of my favorite movement interventions with clients children teens adults is the mirror exercise and you can do this one-on-one -on -one with the client you can do it with groups and group therapy a quote from Elizabeth Benke, there is a deep wisdom within our very flesh, if only we can come to our senses and feel it. With children and teens, um, instead of inviting in movement, I might choose a, a polarity of movement. So I might say, if can you move your arms in a staccato way? And then put on a, a song that supports staccato movements. And everyone, join me in the staccato. See how that feels to your body to move staccato. Does your body like that right now or not? Does it shut you down, energize you? Okay. And now how about moving in a flowing way, more flowing? And join me in this flowing movement. Yeah, just, just notice what does that do to your body? As you flow, and we could, we wanted to put on a song that was more flowing. Okay. There's also fast movements and slow movements. Do staccato fast, <laughs> staccato slow. So playing with qualities of movement and seeing how does that impact 
your body, when you, when your nervous system, again, does it, we, if we work with our polyvagal principles, does it soothe or calm you or energize you? Or do you feel more connected to yourself or others or the world? Or do you feel disconnected when you do that activity? Or does it engage more of your fight or flight response or, or the freeze response? So one of my favorite go-to exercises, I imagine many of you are familiar with it or perhaps have done it many times, is, is inviting a client to imagine a, a real or a made-up safe, calm place. So I invite you right now to think of or to imagine a place where you feel really calm and safe and write down three things you see in that space. Like I'm thinking a, of a river that I just visited recently and I see rocks, clear water, and sunlight. What are three things you see? What are three things you hear in your safe, calm place? And write them down. What are three smells from your safe, calm place? Textures in your safe, calm place? Are there any tastes in your safe, calm place that you're imagining or perhaps it's a real place you have been to or maybe you're there now okay so write those words down we're going to use them in a little bit and now I invite you to give just a brief title to your safe calm place I'm going to name mine serene so give yourself a title or give your safe calm place a title and notice how it feels now as you repeat the title to yourself and imagine all the things you see, smell, and perhaps taste in your safe, calm place. Great. And again, just notice what is this impact on your nervous system? Does this activity calm you in any way or energize you? Or does it shut you down? That might happen too. Who knows? So we each are unique in our life experience, our history, and we're each unique in our nervous system. And what you need is different from what I need and what our client might need. One thing I love about expressive arts therapy is um, a core practice is not just different art forms, but it's layering different art forms. So activity seven, we're going to work with our safe, calm place now and create some guidance and some poetry. So now I invite you to think of your safe, calm place. And I read about Elenita's safe, calm place. I thank you so much for sharing. But think about your safe, calm place and choose um, if your safe, calm place were to, were to share one or two lines of wisdom, what would that place say to you? you know, like if I, for example, I'm thinking of my serene river, what's a message from the river? Very simple one. Sounds very cliche, but just go with the flow, Soraya. Trust the flow of your life. You don't have to control it too much because <laughs> I like to be in control, <laughs> but no, no, no. So that's the wisdom that's coming right now. But what would your safe, calm place say? So this is a way to layer on another, um, you know, writing, a writing practice with the safe, the visualization of the safe, calm place. Can do this with yourself with clients you might invite clients to write some poetry inspired by their safe calm place one of my so looking now at number two here we already did the guidance number one 
Number two is to write a simple I am poem where you write the words I am four times. I am, I am, I am, I am. And then you fill in the blank with images, sounds, sights, smells from your safe, calm place. I am a turquoise river flowing free. I am the love of the sun for the earth. I am, and just let your imagination take you where it goes. But you're using your safe, calm place to inspire that I am poem. Music is such a, a resource. It's such ancient medicine. And so I love to use music with clients in, in different ways. One is to invite them to bring in resourcing songs, songs that are helpful to them, songs that express something they feel or support them or inspire them or empower them. So think about what's a resourcing song for you right now. What's a song? Maybe you repeat it over and over in the car 10 times, or <laughs> maybe you listen to it before bed or just a song you like, like like a, a song I like that actually one of my child client, a recent child client liked was Unstoppable by Sia. I like that song. I feel empowered when I listen to that song. I'm unstoppable. So I... Yeah, sing it out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that song really is good. <laughs> you like it too. Good. Yeah. So so I invite you to share a song that inspires you or supports you or empowers you in some way. Um, and, and please invite your clients to do the same. You can also have clients make a, different kinds of playlists, like a past, present, and future playlist where they have a few songs about their life in the past, a few of their present life. And the third part of songs that are about their future you can have an, a playlist with uplifting songs or soothing songs. Music can heal wounds that medicine cannot touch by Debasi Shmidra. Love that quote. And then musical jams are also wonderful to do, especially in groups. It's very, very hard to demonstrate musical jams on Zoom, uh, but if you can imagine being in a, a therapy group with six people, eight people, and um, sometimes you might have instruments, like I have a little tambourine here, you have everybody choose an instrument, and you might say, okay, one person's going to be the leader, and we're going to support that one person. That's one way to do a musical jam. If you don't have instrument, it can be fun to come up with creative instruments that um, that are homemade, like a spoon and a water glass. Okay, depending on the context you're working in, of course. But having a musical jam is a great way to create that sense of connection in the group. That um, that ventral vagal, that social engagement system is, is activated often in, in a musical jam content context where we get to feel connected without words. Same thing when we dance together. So visual art can also be soothing or sometimes energizing. So some folks love to color. I have here a mandala coloring book. And adults in particular might like to choose a mandala and color them in and listen to a favorite soothing song, okay? Or working with children, coloring book with different animals they like, um, or there um, are some coloring books that are more therapeutic that you can find. You can also draw an animal or find an image of an animal or create collages. I love creating collages, even just really simple ones like 
this one I put together in a, a few minutes, just a centering collage, the images that feel good. I often save little cardboard pieces like this came off my cat food box. I have probably about 10 of these, just, you know, you can use them with yourself or clients. Also scribble drawings are a lovely practice to get out of your inner critic and into a more intuitive place with drawing. So you could say to a client, okay, draw with your non-dominant hand, whatever you're feeling inside. And they close your eyes and just draw with any color that they feel drawn to or two colors. And then they look at the drawing and you might say, oh, find an image of the, in that drawing that, that speaks to you. And what would that image say? So those are a few ideas from visual art. So there's, of course, freeform dancing, which is wonderful anytime um, if the client is drawn to that. Um, I've worked in lots of places with clients with different mobility um, limitations. I've worked in uh, hospitals. And if a person um, wants to, they could just dance with their hands or dance with their head and shoulders or dance whatever body part feels good to dance. So finding ways to move with rhythm. And you can also invite clients to make up dances inspired by prompts. So for example, if I ask you what's something you're grateful for, and if, if you can just write in the chat, what's something you're grateful for? Like, I'm grateful for my health. And then you say, okay, make up a dance move about your health. And I don't know, right now, this is what's coming, an up and down kind of movement. So that's my pose number one, but you make up a pose for what you're grateful for. And then I might say, what's a quality you like about yourself? And I like that I'm um, creative. So make up a pose that represents creativity. So here's my pose number two. Okay, I got pose number one. Pose number two. And now a third prompt. Oh, what's a way you're growing in your life? I um, feel like I'm growing by letting go of things needing to be a certain way. So here's my dance number three. Okay, dance move number three. So I've got number one, number two, number three. Right. And I've made up a dance in no time, less than a minute. That's my three part dance. And so it's a fun thing to do with clients um, of any age, really. And it, it also brings forth a resource depending on how you structure the prompts. So the essential idea be behind polyvagal theory is we have these different states of being. It's normal for all of us to go through all of these different states, the ventral vagal, when we're at ease and connected, my little Buddha. Um, but at times we also, when we're triggered, and especially if we're traumatized, uh, we can get stuck in either a sympathetic fight flight or in the dorsal shutdown, my little bear representing the shutdown. So. These art practices are intended to be ways to help support our nervous system, to learn about our nervous systems and to support ourselves both in co-regulation and self-regulation. So the co-regulation of course is, is something we bring to our clients, this being able to nourish and attune to our nervous system needs and then being able to be present for our clients in that way. Um, and then the, the co-regulation also invites the client to think about um, how they can be with people that help their nervous system and also set boundaries with, with people who throw their nervous system off. So there's the co-regulation piece. Um, and also speaks to the importance of healthy connections. And then the self-regulation is the client learning to be masters and students at the same time, students and masters of their own nervous system. So 
uh, clients know what they need when they're in, say, a dorsal shutdown to help kind of activate them in a healthy way. Uh, maybe it's dancing with friends. Maybe it's reading a book that inspires them. But really, it, it's not the particular activity. It's how your nervous system responds to that uh, activity or person or practice. And just some of the last questions to that I like to remember when I'm with a client is what helps me attune to them energetically, what soothes the client, what activates them in a healthy way, and what helps the client feel connected to themselves and others. Such a rich um, session from Soraya, just a um, really incredible share from everybody. So um, just want to close it out with a big round of thanks for Soraya. Please keep in touch. Uh, we're on all these channels that you see, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And with that, we want to give thanks to our funder, SAMHSA, um, for making this available um, at no cost.